This story happened, as I said to me, by accident when I was a reporter uh, for the television channel NDTV in Gujarat. And I felt that people there, this is the year after Gujarat was consumed by uh, the anti-Muslim pogrom of the year 2002, so 20 years ago. And all the middle class Hindus, most of the middle class Hindus that I met, everywhere across districts of Gujarat would keep saying, you will not understand why we supported the mobs. But it made me think, if so many people are so attracted by this kind of politics, then there has to be a reason to understand where that's coming from. Rather than just saying, oh my god, how can you be this? You try and understand, okay, why is it that this is so attractive? So I kept asking myself and other civil society actors, journalists, that who is going to work with the perpetrators of this violence? Are we not going to look inside those spaces and if we don't, aren't we condemned to repeat this forever and ever? And I didn't have the answer right then, but the answer fell into my lap by accident the following year when I was following some riot relief stories and I met someone who was at the edge of the mob, who had been part of the mobs in 2002 as a warrior. He said at that time, Gujarat was cut into two even halves. Those that were out there celebrating and those that were cut and killed and raped. And he said, I was with the half that was celebrating. But he was a student from a dominant caste, spoke English, was doing a master's in liberal arts. And when he finished his master's, uh, by the time uh, he was doing his master's, um, the violence happened and engulfed uh, 16 to 18 districts of Gujarat, or half of Gujarat, uh, in this diet of heat. And some of these lynch mobs came to his hostel and said, oh, you know, on this day, this Muslim uh, person's shoe shop is going to be abandoned, so come. Uh, you and your friends can also loot this shop and you have a window of opportunity. And he said, I didn't want to loot these shops, but I didn't want to miss out on the action. So he went along with these mobs. After the violence was over and the riots was finished, his degree finished, and this man was looking for a job, this young man. And because he'd done a liberal arts degree, the best place to get a job with a decent salary, a decent middle class salary, was in the NGO sector. And the NGO sector at that point of time was all university basically engaged in providing relief to victims of the riots in which this man had been a participant. And that is where he found himself getting a job. So after cheering on for the death and destruction of Muslims, he found himself rehabilitating them for money, for a salary. Initially he hated them, his hate continued to manifest. But it confused him because until then he had carried this idea of this idea of Muslims um, as, as people who are jihadis, as people who kill goats and therefore um, and learn how to cut off goats' heads when they're children and therefore consumed with ideas of violence and are used to cutting and killing and seeing blood. Uh, the kind of ideas that have become the surround sound in India. Uh, not just in the partition years, but it's come to hit us in the face again. And he was consumed by these ideas because he actually didn't have any day-to-day -day interaction with Muslims. Now that he was rehabilitating them as his job, uh, he was forced to interact with them and it disturbed him to see how there was actually not any difference between the Hindus and Muslims and that they were not like him. And that disturbed him. And he said, oh my God, am I then the satanic person, not them? Am I this person who's consumed by this hate? Do I? Is there something wrong with me? And he couldn't live with that for a very long time. When I met him, he is undergoing this transformation. And he, he underwent this massive transformation from a space of hate uh, to a left liberal atheist. And I had loose flesh. I, I didn't know it was possible for hate to change. And that told me that I must examine the story properly because I said, if hate can change, then there's space for hope. Um, what does that change mean? Is it easy? Is it difficult? Is it the most impossible thing anyone can ever put themselves through? Because it means nullifying your childhood, not being able to identify with your parents, with your family, making a compromise in the life that you left behind and then the compromise that you, uh, with the life that you're now living because people uh, don't really understand where you come from. So he, this man who underwent this transformation was also the loneliest man I've ever known. Um, this told me though that one has to work inside the space of hate in order to transform it. 
But this man was only the outer kernel of that story of hate and I felt that it was also equally important to understand hate from inside the spaces where uh, people cut and kill and rape and that took me to the next protagonist of my book. Uh, a man who was serving out a 31 year jail sentence until recently. Of course now he's out and about like um, other uh, murderers and rapists from 2002 including the famous Bilkis Bano case that is now in the news because um, her uh, attackers were released on India's 75th year of independence. So just like, like Bilkis' rapist, this man, Suresh Jadeja, um, raped and killed Muslim women and he, were, he, he bragged about it. Uh, a journalist filmed him bragging about it and he said, I raped Muslim women till they were pulverized to pickle. And he did this while being married to a Muslim woman. The most perplexing thing of this story was partly the fact that he was married to a Muslim woman, but also that he bragged about it. Bragging seems to be front and center of this politics of hate. It means this is a performance, and that means there's an audience. Who is the audience, I was asking myself. Is Suresh just Suresh? No. Suresh is an embodiment of the collective diet of voyeuristic hate that all of us consume, that most of us actually want, but secretly outsource to somebody like Suresh because we don't dare do it ourselves. So he is actually collecting that diet of hate and performing what other people want done but don't dare to do themselves. And so therefore he's dragging about it to them saying, see I've done what you wanted. And that is the scariest part of the Suresh story and needed to be understood. But how did Suresh turn out to be Suresh? Um, it's a long story, but in a few lines, uh, I will take you there to, to demonstrate why it's important to enter this space. Because from the outside, when you hear someone talking about raping and killing Muslim women and pulverizing them to pickle, it, it makes you stop in your tracks and not want to understand this space. You don't think it's possible to understand. And when you do that, you actually stop at the surface level of this and don't actually look inside this space. Don't see who the consumers of Suresh's story are, which I think is actually what is holding up this edifice of hate. People like you and me. People who harbor fears, fantasies of the other that we don't even know we're carrying. And that is why it's important to look at the Suresh story. Suresh comes from a community that was shunned for about 150 years. The Charas are one of over 180 uh, criminal tribes, people that were criminalized under the, by the British for being nomadic because the British felt they could be couriers of information to revolutionaries and they didn't want uh, an 1857 revolt to happen all over again and for their power to be snatched from underfoot. So they put all of these nomadic communities in internment camps or jail-like cells. And even after India was independent and the Criminal Tribes Act was, that the British wrote was struck down, many of these tribes continued to be picked up by the police even today and uh, locked away uh, for uh, crimes that the police is looking for scapegoats for. And so in this community, uh, many people had no choice over time but to become thieves, criminals, gamblers and in Gujarat, which is a non-drinking state where liquor is prohibited, many of them brew their own liquor, sell it to people in the black market. Um, but they did this because they said that the system is not going to take care of us, we are going to do an up yours to the system. So there was a certain amount, uh, there were some people amongst uh, Suresh's communities where an, an everyday uh, criminal activity was something that, was, that became partly uh, part of the system by default and by circumstance. However, that doesn't explain why Suresh did what he did because his brothers didn't do the same. So that's why the personal intersected with the social space. Um, Suresh had a bad leg. He had polio and he, his, he had muscular dystrophy in one leg and he couldn't move his leg. And so um, when Suresh uh, was a small child, his father disowned him for being handicapped in this way by this disease. And he said, I don't know who my mother, who my wife has slept with to produce this boy. He's not my child. I don't know who that slut has slept with. And he would talk like this about his own son, call him a sister fucker and a mother fucker, um, out in the street in front of everybody. So this four, five, six year old grew up with a great amount of self-loathing and hate. His primary identity was of not liking himself. 
his only way of processing strong emotions was heat at this precise time when suresh was growing up with all of this uh, organizations uh, hindu evangelical organizations like the bajrangdal and the vishwa hindu parishad were proselytizing people and trying to bring local leaders within their fold and suresh became the local goon or gunda in his colony who would say okay if the police is not um, uh, if you are a landlord and, and you know a uh, tenant owes you rent but you are a chara and so from your from this community that the police anyway considers to be criminal and you are not going to be able to throw out the tenant who is illegally occupying your space i will beat them up for you so he had a protectorate of people who would go to him to get their jobs done so while he was growing up and utilizing his hate to beat up people and build this protectorate uh in this colony he lived in the hindu hindu groups like the bajrang dal were also counter proselytizing looking for leaders and they they uh, they uh, took him within their fold uh, talked to him about love jihad about uh, breaking down the babri mosque in ayodhya in uttar pradesh um and at that precise time suresh's sister ran away with a muslim man so he felt humiliated yet again by his family saying that i believe in a certain set of ideas and my sister has basically mocked me by running away with a man i can from a community i consider to be the enemy so he swore publicly just like his father used to talk publicly about him he said i they have these muslims have taken one person from my community i am going to take one from theirs and so he forcibly seduced a muslim woman married her proceeded to turn her into his first victim now you can see where suresh comes from and how he became what he became and if we don't look at these spaces if we don't try and understand what is going on in these spaces um we will never be able to understand how to undo this hate so the one thing that i understood um by going down this route and telling this story or these stories is being able to see how actually there is hope actually hate is changeable uh, amorphous thing it is not fixed and if we continue to see it as fixed we will not understand it and we will not be able to combat it so the first step to being able to change it is to be able to see what it is and see that it is actually something that constantly transforms even in the more in the worst cases where it actually transforms for the worse and the hate only builds up and becomes worse we can see where it comes from and it is crucial to do that if we do not want to continue to subscribe to this sort of politics thank you very much for being on this journey with me goodbye